They drove back to their house. They got the kids of the house. They got the house examined. And indeed, those children would have died from monoxide poisoning if they hadn't been gone to the hospital and watched Rescue 911. Is that like a wild story? And I think everybody here should get up on their feet and welcome the man, the legend himself, the one and the only, Mr. William Shatner! Everybody. Hello. 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 There we go. Hello. <laughs> so, here we are on a rainy Sunday afternoon. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, I, I'm, uh, yes, I'm coming to you. You're the first one. Um, <laughs> so, I'm going to do a cruise this, uh, uh, this uh, Christmas. Uh, an Antarctic cruise. So for about 10, 12 days from um, Buenos Aires to the ship that takes off from the tip of South America and gets the, to the Antarctic and then moving around the Antarctic. It's, it's, it's a big deal. And uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is coming on and I love him and so we'll have a lot of discussions. And, and the reason I bring it up is uh, they, they said, w what do you want to do? How are you going to entertain? I said, well, I'll speak to the people for an evening. You know, and they said, well, what's the subject matter? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to speak about, but we'll let the audience suggest it. What should we talk about? Oh, look at that. You had your hands up. You're moving around. Now that I ask you, you're, you're, you're voiceless. No, it has to be you. It ha no, stand up. Stand up. Miss Shyness, stand up. You got your teddy bear with you. Turn around. Okay. Now, what's our subject matter? No, don't ask him. No, you're, you're, you're out of it. What's your name? What? Michelle. Michelle, you're a singular voice. You're going to grasp yourself by the personality, <laughs> and you're going to tell me what we should talk about. What, what, you know, what I'm asking is, what, what, what intrigues you? Anything. Is it the stars? Is it subterranean? Is it in the air? Is it my jacket? You can read. <laughs> My jacket's Atari. I got a funny story to tell you, but 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 what I'm saying to you is, choose a subject matter, and I, I mean it'll be magical. But just you're carrying, you're carrying a little teddy bear, right? A lion. A, a lion. Oh, a little lion. Better. Why? Uh, Here's a microphone. Uh, right into it. Well, put your mouth right on it. Come on, kiddo, you're involved now. Now you're involved. I take them everywhere on Facebook, and Wh I take them all over to the Why? celebrities. Why do you take them everywhere? What's his name? Cecil. Cecil? Mm -hmm. why, why do you take Cecil around? Um, Comforting. It started back a few years ago when I met a guy downtown, and he was carrying a little animal, and he said, I'm old. He says, you're probably thinking I'm old, and I says... No, not really. And he says, "Why you want to know why I'm carrying this? And I says, yeah. He says, get yourself a stuffed animal that you really like and start posting them. Take them everywhere. Just do it. So my husband found this little guy the day that the, the lion got killed. His name was Cecil. They killed him. Well, Cecil the lion in, um, in Florida, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I followed that. Put the microphone right, right close. And he found it, this lion in East Aurora. So well, wait a minute. What has Cecil got to do? I mean, that's the name of your bear, now, uh, your lion now. Yes. But what did the live... Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. There was a lady who had lion mm -hmm. and... 
there was a guy who had a lion nearby. There was, there was some competition between the two people. Am I not? I think. I can't remember too far. But I what I think it was was somebody had a pet lion, and anybody in the audience, now we've got the subject matter, okay? <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> so now we're talking about the extension of our emotions onto animals or objects or careers or micro you know, what are, are our hang-ups and why are they there is an interesting subject. So <clears throat> tell me your name again. Michelle has Cecil as a result of meeting somebody who had a lion, a real live lion, who died under tragic circumstances. Cecil lives in Michelle, Michelle, right? Cecil lives in Michelle's emotions, which are transferred to the to the the the, the, the stuffed bear, stuffed a, a lion, and it lives, or does it live, or is it dead? Is there well? What is a statue? A statue is emblematic of what happened before, whether it was uh, the, the 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 Civil War or or a gravestone of somebody who died generations ago, and the family goes and says, "I hope you're okay, dear," and they don't never met the dead person, but we. We retrieve the dead by having objects that we can see. Cecil is dead, but Cecil lives. I mean, it's really, it's fantastic. You in the green. Yes. Stand up. Somebody give, get the microphone over to him. There you go. You're not somebody. What's your name? Stay there. My name's Chris. Wait, wait, before, wait. Your name? Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. You're not somebody. You're Kyle. Yeah, uh, what's your name? My name is Chris. What do you think of what that silly subject that we started to talk about? I mean, it's not so silly. She keeps memory alive of somebody from the past who, or in this case, the lion, which was important to her. And I think it's a great idea. Yeah. And do you have anything like that? Uh, what do we call them? Uh, objects from the dead? Uh, what? A photo? A totem. It's exactly right. So we have totems all over the place. I keep memories alive of guys I served with. How do you do it. that? Mostly just in my head, but I do have some photos I keep. Do you have a totem? No. Of just, anybody? Nope, just Do you have photos. a cross? Do you have a, uh, a, a, a piece of jewelry? Or, or what's your memory? My memory, unfortunately, is it's private. I, I don't share it. You, you don't want to share it? No, sir. Why not? It's difficult. It's t related it's to my time in the service. I just, it's very private. Okay, I don't want to interfere with your privacy. On the other hand, what could be less private than people you've never met, and yet you share an experience that we might learn from? Why don't we see if you were, would be comfortable in this way? If, without mentioning any names, or what exactly the experience was, can you just hover and share with us why it's so personal and why you're reluctant to share it with anybody, let alone complete strangers who will forget? It's kind of hard to explain. So if anyone in here had served... Let me, let combat, me share with you uh, an experience of mine. And I can't tell you the name, the name of the, what I'm about to... The story I'm about to tell you, because it's a well-known personality. I was doing an interview show. I've forgotten which one it was, but it was one, as, one that I, I really liked was... Uh, entitled, I, I, I Don't Know, or I Don't Understand, and I would talk to people about what it is I don't understand. I don't understand. 
two plus two. I mean, what is math? Uh, what are mathematics? I, things you don't understand. So this well-known personality came up, and we were talking, as you and I are, I are and he said, uh, and I don't remember how I intruded into his experience, but he said, I'm a real Catholic. I'm a very ardent Catholic. But my baby was born with an affliction. I don't remember what the affliction was. And it so moved him. He went everywhere to try and have it blessed, to have the affliction removed. And nothing happened. And then he went further into voodooism. He went anywhere he could to try and find some spiritual way of removing whatever it was wrong with the baby. And that's antithetic and, and to his Catholicism. And he said, that's where how desperate I was. And it never worked, of course. So he came back. I said, that's an incredible story. And he left the studio. Fifteen minutes later, the, the phone rang. And he said, listen, I've been thinking about the story I told you. And I don't want you to play it on the air. Would you not play it on the air? And it was a sensational story. If it gave you the name of the guy who's now dead, it would be like, wow, what an what a insight into the torture, into the emotions of that guy. I've never revealed the name. But the concept of going deep into the torture, into the deep emotions that disturb you, the concept of going there and sharing it was enormous. So I tell you that story because you're innocuous. We don't know who you are, where you've been, what, you, what you've done. So sharing that story might enlighten you, might enlighten us, might give us an insight not only into you but into humanity, into a battleground story that uh, so few of us have ever experienced. Is there anything there that, that appeals to you? Well, it all appeals. It's, it's still just, it's a private moment. I keep it I within a close circle of friends that I start with, and that's where I'll stay. And uh, that was in, 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 the, in, in the forces? Yes, sir. I was an uh, Air Force combat controller. I served three tours in Afghanistan. I see. First of all, I thank you for your service. Thank you. And I, and I thank you for, for clinging to your... Uh, what would you like to... So we're back to uh, experiences and, and th things that... Have you got your hand up? Please. Could I just quickly ask you a question? Uh, uh, anything. Uh, just uh, hang on a second over there. H how did you ever get involved into Rescue 911? How did I get into Rescue 911? What a, a fascinating jump <laughs> that, that is. Because Rescue 911 was, um, was a show that went on for five years and is never really mentioned. And it was a popular show for five years. Why, was it, why is it never mentioned along with this other stuff I've done? I don't know. Um, but based on the number of letters I received um, uh, that people said, I, we learned something and we saved, you saved my life or you saved that life, we recounted that we saved the show in five years, saved about 3,000 people's lives. And... Yeah, and I'll tell you a story. You see how this is working, right? One thing leads to another. Uh, I'll tell you a story about Rescue 911 that I don't believe, I don't believe I've ever told it. Is there any water up here? Okay. Is there a bottle of water? Gentlemen, lady, thank you. Um, a married couple were living in their home, and they... Uh, um, were watching, I think, uh, the show or some show. They had three kids living in the house, and they went to bed and went to sleep. And the wife woke up some hours later and nudged her husband and said, I've got a blinding headache. 
I think I should go to the hospital. Would you open that for me? Thank you. There you go. And so off they went to the hospital. They had the three kids, but the hospital was nearby. So they left the three kids in the, in the, in the house, and they drove to the hospital. And now they got into the waiting room, <clears throat> and they were told, you know, you got a half an hour wait. So they sat there, and the woman with a blinding headache, and there was a television set on, and Rescue 911 was on the television set. It was on, on the air. And, uh, and they're looking at the show. The show's about monoxide gas. And the husband and wife say, wait a minute. That, those are the symptoms I feel. We're suffering from monoxide gas. We got the three kids in the house. They jumped back in the car. They drove back to their house. They got the kids in the house. They got the house examined. And indeed, those children would have died from monoxide poisoning if they hadn't been gone to the hospital and watched Rescue 911. Is that like a wild story? I haven't told that in a long time. Gary, you have somebody that you actually. This lady here. Hello. Hello. Mr. And, and can is there somebody? Yeah. Can you hear me all right back? I there? can hear you well, but I was asking somebody else in addition to. <laughs> all right. We're all sharing this moment, okay? All right. What's your what's your what's your question? So my question is, uh, how was your experience in space, and what was it like? Okay, I, I'll go there, although that isn't the totem that we were talking about. Yes, all right, I, I will go there because you've asked the question. So about a lot of years ago, I read the book called um, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Two hundred people watch me drink a <laughs> bottle of water. Um, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, in which she said the reason birds are dying is because of DDT, and DDT was being lauded as the uh, insecticide that will save the world. It will increase uh, food production, getting rid of all the insects. And uh, it's the answer to starvation, which mankind ultimately will face because our basic problem is overpopulation. What the earth can uh, produce to, to allow everybody to survive. It's Malthusian in its, uh, in its uh, thought in that sooner or later, and uh, Malth Malthus... Uh, thought that it would be sooner that we would run out of places to feed and we would all be dying of starvation because we're too many people. <clears throat> Mankind, this incredible mind that humans have, which is part godlike, spiritual, of the highest order, and the other part of us which is savage and, and uh, are killers. So Malthus said, as of this date, it was like the 1800s or 19, early 1900s, we're all going to run out of food. What he didn't take into account was our ability, ability to invent. We invented uh, foods that would, things that would uh, uh, feed the fields uh, and thusly produce more food per acre than we were doing when we were just plowing. We didn't realize that in plowing, we were destroying the earth and we plowed everything up. Then we, destroy, then we discovered that plowing was bad and we went back to not plowing and then plowing circular. And then science took over and they invented the uh, ability to, to enhance the richness of the earth. And we did that. And then we saw, oh, well, insects. So we'll kill all the insects, not realize, like, realizing that the insects are pollinators. So we were both... Uh, uh, making life and destroying at the same time, which is what we humans do, apparently. So, DDT is invented, 
and it's the greatest insecticide ever invented. Got rid of all the insects. Everything that was interfering with the growth of food. It also interfered with everything that was living because everything was living off of insects. So the birds would lay their eggs and the shells would be too soft to contain the, the, uh, the, the yolk, so the eggs would break. And the, the eggs began to die. This was, what, 50 years ago. And they did their research and they said, hey, it's DDT. Let's stop DDT. So in most places they stopped DDT, DDT, the birds came back. So I read this book all about that, but it was also about global warming, uh, which is what we invented. Uh, instead of letting nature have its course, we dammed up the rivers, we, uh, we did all the, we interfered with nature to such a degree that we now have two hurricanes, one on top of each other. And if we think that's it, you're mistaken. There are going to be more hurricanes, worse than we've had, because the hotter the air gets, the more moisture it has in the air, and the more moisture it has in the air, the more it rains, and the more it ra You got it. So that's global warming. And that's not going, to, not going to stop until we stop doing what we're doing. So we've got to stop what we're doing. All this I knew. So now, get ready to go uh, up uh, in a spaceship, and... We rehearse uh, for three days, uh, getting into the seat, because in weightless now there's no way of imitating. You can't get ready for weightlessness, even in the swimming pool, because nothing's like weightlessness. I'm one of apparently 600 people who were weightless, and it's there. There are no words to describe it. You're floating around, but it's like a dream. It's like you're. It's, I, I don't even think it's what you must feel like if you're caught up in a tornado. I mean, you're looking down, oh my God, I'm floating, I'm going to crash soon. Uh, <laughs> I wonder how long <laughs> I could be this, this afraid. I mean, I wonder what it's like. It's like falling out of an airplane without a parachute. And you're going down at uh, whatever that speed is, 132 miles per second per second, which I don't even know what that means. And, and you're going down and you're con you got to be conscious, right? You got to be thinking, holy shit, I'm going to hit the ground. <laughs> and then you hit the ground and you don't remember anything. So weightless has got to be something like that, I guess. What's weightless is going to be like? So we practice getting to a five-point harness, weightless, or, or presuming weightless. So you're in this prostrate, prostrate position like this, and now get a five-point harness, because getting out of the five-point harness is easy. Getting back in, apparently in weightlessness is very difficult. So we do that for three days, and then we go, we, we go to the spaceship. Um, so we get to the spaceship, and as I walk by it, it's off-gassing what looks like steam. And I said, what's that? They said, it's hydrogen. Hydrogen. Have you all seen those uh, documentaries on the Hindenburg? You know what's burning? Hydrogen. Hydrogen is burning. So those lighter than aircraft, lighter than air aircraft, Zeppelins, of which the Hindenburg was one, came across with all the people who had paid money to be on board and then docked in New Jersey and they ran the, the landing line to hook onto the Zeppelin, to the Hindenburg. What they didn't realize was static electricity went up the landing line and across the anodized body of the Zeppelin. It was coated in an aluminum paint which is metallic, which took the electrical impulse right across the 300-foot body to the far end where there was a little leakage of hydrogen gas. Boom. And do you remember the announcer saying, oh, the humanity of it all. And you see little people this small running like hell from 
I was getting in a ship <laughs> that had that kind of gas. How am I doing for time? I don't want to know the time. How much time do I have? About nine minutes. Nine? Nine. I'm going to stay alive for nine minutes. <laughs> so I get in the ship in my seat, which is lying back, and I strap myself in, and they close the door, and we're closed, and the countdown begins. T minus 20, T minus 19, whoop! Hold it, hold the count, there's an anomaly. <laughs> what the hell's an anomaly? What's an anomaly? Oh yeah, anomaly is something that doesn't belong there. Maybe that's me. Uh, okay, we cleared up the anomaly, uh, T minus 80, 70, 60, and now uh, I'm going to tell you the God's truth. I mean, nothing's been embellished up to now, but what I'm about to tell you sounds like an embellishment. It isn't. All right, everybody, says the guy in the loudspeaker. We're going to remove the gantry. Anybody who wants to get off should get off now. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, here I go. I can't. I'm Captain Kirk. <laughs> so I stay, and the countdown goes off. They remove the gantry. Boom, the ignition. The hydrogen ignites, and I'm compressed in my seat, and I think, good God, I'm going to die. And then we're through the Carmen line, and the gravity is off, and they say, uh, we're in weightlessness. And I undo the five-point harness, and I float out of my seat. Now, when I was asked to go, I, was at, I, I had brought up the idea of me going to Jeff Bezos a year and a half before. I flew to um, Seattle, and uh, we had a meeting. And I mean, wouldn't it be great? Uh, Blue Origin's going to go up. Wouldn't it be great if Captain Kirk went up? Yeah, it's a great idea. We'll talk about it. Thank you very much for coming. And we left. We went back home. Then COVID hit, and a year and a half goes by. And then I read that Bezos himself is going to go up with his brother and with um, uh, a lady astronaut who didn't go up and with a... Uh, with a uh, with a uh, young guy, uh, a teenager. And that's who's going to go up, the four people that were going to go up. Oh, dear, too bad. I'm not going to go up first. Uh, that was a good idea. but And then they go up, and they come back down. And it's noted, but it isn't, you know, it isn't big news. It was uh, Jeff Bezos went up. Get a phone call a little while later. Would you like to go up second? I'm not going to go up second. <laughs> it's like getting the vice president. Would you want the president? I want the president. Too late. No, I don't want to go. I'm lying in bed one day early, a few days later, and I'm in that b b between the, the sleep and the, and the waking state where your best thoughts come. And I've got a book out there now. It's uh, entitled uh, Boldly Go, which says, go. You know, no matter what age you are, whatever you, get, get out there and go and say yes to life. Say yes. Go out there with new ideas and new, and, and, and new people and new friends and, and new, just get the hell out of the house and walk. Go somewhere. Say yes to the adventure of life. That's the book. I'm thinking, hey, why don't I say yes to life? So I call up that deck that day, and I said, okay, I'll go up second. I'm going to go up second. So now I'm up in the air, and I'm weightless. And I see the other people uh, striking fists today. Hey, look at us. We're up there. And I had remembered some footage that I had seen of Jeff Bezos at the adolescent. And, you know, you're floating... You're, I was, rather than get up, I'll demonstrate. So, so you're floating in the air, and Bezos is floating. There's a camera, 
and he's floating with his head this way and his legs out like that. And the kid, now they're weightless, is throwing candies at his rear end. <laughs> like you, whatever you call that thing, block, you know, whack-a-mole or what. Oh, that is the weirdest thing. You're weightless and you're in space for the first time and the last time in your life and you're throwing candies at your asshole? Are you kidding me? So I, I made a deal with myself that I wasn't going to do that. So now I'm weightless and I make my way over to the window as quickly as I can. And for some reason, I'm looking back and um, I see the wake of the spaceship through the air. I've never heard that me mentioned before. The thing is going through the air and it's leaving a wake. Holy mackerel, nobody, nobody ever mentioned that before. That of course the ship is disturbing the air and looking like a submarine underwater is making waves. And then I look front, up ahead, and I see blackness. And the blackness I'm thinking, I, I'm seeing, is if you've ever been in a cave, uh, like on a tourist thing, and they close the door to the cave, and now you're in blackness, and suddenly you're, like, you're losing your, your balance because you, you you're attached to nothing. It's, it's so palpable. It's so there, the blackness, that it's like a, a force. Like you've got to brace yourself. That's the blackness I saw. The blackness that lies in space, and I've been a student of space, as you can imagine, for so many years. I'm intrigued by the awesomeness of space. I mean, just the, the most recent pictures of the, of the uh, telescope, of the, um, the our telescope. The what? The Hubble and the... And the web. The Hubble and the web uh, telescopes are showing us a story of how incredible, bizarre, what did uh, Einstein say? The, not the craziness, the spookiness of space. It's so spooky out there. Things are exploding and, and descending and accreting and black holes are sucking and other things are expelling and it, the energy, the things that are going on in space are unimaginable. We can only see bits of it. I designed a watch that has the Webb telescope looking at the earth and the, and the sky, uh, the earth and the, and the sky. Uh, it's a space watch just based on what the web is showing us in its clarity and its, and its uh, d d d different uh, uh, red scale. So we're only catching a glimpse of the incredible mystery of space. That's what I am a student. Not. That's what I'm with you all uh, in, in the mystery. I saw none of that. The only thing I saw in that window, that blackness of the window was black. There was no mystery there. It was death. There was no question about it. That was death. This was life. The beige of the Texas desert, the whiteness of the, of the clouds, the blue of the air. That's life. That's death. And all those things that are going extinct, I just felt them going extinct. There's, there's a million things as we speak, as you listen to me right now, things are going extinct that we didn't even know existed. That's the sadness. The sadness is it took 3.8 billion years of life to, 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 to come to this point, to evolve to this point. And they're dying, and we didn't know they evolved. They didn't know the magic. Everything is tied together in a skein of life that, that we all realize. Trees talk to each other. Not just pheromones that float down, say to, to the other trees downwind, the beetles are coming, uh, uh, make your, your sap more toxic. 
It's by electrochemical means, by their, by their roots to other trees. That's how magical nature is. And that's how tied together. If they, with electrochemical signals along the mycelium of the fungi, can send a signal, our brains work through electrochemical signals along the dendrites. It's exactly the same thing. That's slower, ours are faster, but it's exact. We're, we're so connected. Why don't you stand up? Okay. <laughs> I wonder what stooping would have helped. I don't know. Where are you going, by the way? Nine minutes. I was so moved, I didn't realize how moved I was until I landed. And when I landed and stepped out of the spaceship, I was weeping, and I didn't know why I was crying. And I, as I thanked everybody, and I'm still crying. I go and sit down. What am I doing? Cameras all around, and why am I crying? And I realized I was in grief, and I was in grief for our world. Thank you very much, everybody. Pleasure. Please be sure to visit him at his table. Hey, this is Wilson Cruz from Star Trek Discovery, and you're watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like and share, plus have fun and follow your fandom. Doctor's orders.